Hello, good morning everyone. This is Mike Smith, ECA Technical Director. Uh, here again to introduce you to our second in our series of Technical Tuesday Talks. Um, many of you will be aware that the government introduced new legislation for uh, electrical safety in the private rented sector and this is today's topic. So Gary Parker will be taking us through um, the presentation. Luke Osborne, Shahid Khan and myself from the technical team will be in the background. Um, we'll monitor any questions uh, and once again if you want to ask a question please use the Q&A chat facility. Um, we may try and answer as we go along depending on what type of question it is or, or maybe even interrupt Gary as we go along um, just to put him off his uh, thread and, and get him to do something. Um, or we'll save to the end and we'll have a question, uh, question answer session uh, at the end. Now last week we did have a lot of questions that came through either right as we closed or, or after we actually closed down the session. So, um, and obviously we can't leave a big silence at the end uh, waiting for a question to come through. So please try and get them through as soon as you can. Um, then we can have them within the Q&A session, but don't worry. Um, if, the, if your questions come through, we will answer them and we will get that answer back to you. No problem at all. So I think uh, what I'll do is hand over to Gary now. So good morning, Gary. Um, the floor is yours. Thanks, Mike. Morning, everybody. Hope you're all fit and as well as can be uh, in these strange times. Hopefully, we've got some good news for you today with this topic, and it will be of interest to members and landlords alike. Now, do bear with us. The uh, technology we're using is a little bit new, so apologies if there's any dropouts. My colleague will be monitoring for sound losses in the background or if the slides aren't moving quite quick enough. So what we're going to try and cover today is the statutory requirements for electrical safety and the regulations for this new specific topic. And we're going to delve in a little bit with the technical requirements, what we have to do uh, following this, this piece of legislation. But we're not going to cover that too much because we'll, uh, we'll cover that again a little bit later on. And then at the end, if we've got some questions, we'll try and uh, cover those off then. But as Mike says, please fire away as we're going through and the guys in the background will try the best to help you out. So a new statutory instrument has been created that requires private landlords to maintain their electrical installation. Up until now, the requirements have always been implied. It's always been good practice. Some landlords have done it, some landlords haven't. But now we've got a new statutory instrument coming out. And from the 1st of June 2020, the electrical safety standards in the private rented sector for England, only for England, regulations 2020 are coming into force. And this will place some legal duties on landlords in the private rented sector to maintain their electrical installations. Now, generally in social housing, landlords and housing associations and the likes have always maintained their installations fairly well. But private landlords, as I say, it's always been good uh, practice, but not always followed. Now, this uh, is a nice, quick and easy link that you can see there. You can probably copy that down in seconds. Uh, we will put the presentation and all the questions and all the answers on the website afterwards. So the, the, the link will be available from there. If any contractor or any landlord out there wants to find out about it, the legislation is free, it's available and you can download it. It is still in draft, however. So if you are looking at it, let's just make sure we're not setting ourselves up for a fall. The regulations are still in draft until finally published. But from what we're looking at and what we're seeing, you can get hold of them and they should be fairly still between now and uh, June. So we're going to look at now what's throughout the regulations and the requirements within them. And there's several parts to this regulation. Some of them are more pertinent to us than others. So the most relevant bits I would have thought will be two, three, four and five. But we'll we'll give you a bit of background and a bit of information about the other parts and we'll go through the legalities around them as well. So regulations, as we say, are cited as the electrical safety standards in the private rented sector, England, 2020. 
the, not for Wales, not for Scotland. Scotland already has their own regulations. The Welsh uh, Assembly will possibly bring something in, but these are specific for England and they apply to all new specified tenancies from the 1st of July this year and all existing specified tenancies from the 1st of April of next year. So anybody who's got a private rented dwelling or is in a privately rented dwelling, this will apply to you at some point in the near future. Part one gives us some definitions and explains some, uh, some parts of the regs. The most relevant one, I think, is the term qualified person. And it says a qualified person means a person competent to undertake inspection and testing required under regulation three, that's part of the uh, PRS regs, and any further investigative or remedial work in accordance with the electrical safety standards. That means you. They don't define what a qualified person is. They don't go into competent or skilled brackets electrically like 7671 does, but it does talk about qualified persons. Now it's not overly clear and it would have been better from our side of things if the regs said you must be a member of a trade association like ECA, but it says that the person doing the work must be suitably competent and that means us. We've got license to do this work, we can certainly go out there and start uh, helping out landlords. And the duties it puts on the private landlords are, well, the very, very good for us, I must say. It explains that the private landlord is to ensure their electrical installation is safe, fit for purpose, and tested at regular intervals of no more than five years. Now, of course, you can drop that down if you want, if you find the installation is um, not suitable, not safe, not adequate, you can easily drop that down, but it shouldn't go beyond more than five years. And it must be carried out before the tenancy commences in relation to any new tenancy or by the 1st of April for uh, any existing tenancies for 2021. So that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work for landlords, letting agents and for us, the contracting industry, to go out and do. But then it puts more duties on the private landlords because the private landlords have not only got to get us in to do an inspection and test and prove the installation is safe and sound. They also must retain copies of the report and issue the copies to the tenants to make sure the, uh, the tenants are content with the work. And also, if there's any remedial work, it must be carried out within 28 days or sooner. So no uh, chance of going in and putting a raft of C1 and C2s or FIs against an installation and just leaving them. The landlord must ensure this work is completed within 28 days. Written proof that the remedial work has been completed and the installation is, ex is electrically safe shall then be given to the landlord and retained. Now, just on this topic, there's no need to go into a property, uh, issue it as an unsatisfactory, fix it, and you don't need to then do another periodic. You can just issue a statement. That's absolutely fine. Items number one, two, three, six, seven, eight, and nine have all been corrected. This installation is now electrically safe. You may need to do uh, additional certificates, minor electrical installation works or full installation work certificate if you're doing new circuits or consumer units, but the whole property doesn't need to then be uh, retested in a periodic style. There are some requirements within the legislation for the local housing authority as well. And part three talks about the duties of the local housing authority to serve remedial notices on landlords that are in breach of the regulations. So it's got some teeth. Where a perceived breach of the regulations is found, the housing authority has to give the opportunity to the landlord to correct them. But the housing authority can also recover reasonable costs from the private landlord when a remedial notice is served upon them and not action. And this is effectively stage one. So we go out and do a periodic uh, test on the property. If the landlord doesn't do anything about it, the local housing authority can serve notice upon them. And then, well, 
what if they don't do anything about that? Ah, the local housing authority has got even more power. They can, with the consent of the tenant, enter the property and fix the dangerous elements of that installation. And this is effectively stage two with a competent person doing that work. Those costs can then be uh, brought against the landlord and effectively pay for the work to be done. So it does have even more teeth. And then if the landlord is still not doing what they're supposed to do, there are some potential financial penalties for them. And in short, it's a lot of money. It's up to £30,000. So there's good reason why a landlord should want to maintain an electrical installation from a safety and practical point of view. At the end of the day, the installation is there and it can be dangerous if not done properly. So let's make it safe, let's do it properly from the tenant's regard, but also it's in their interest financially to make sure the property is adequately maintained and in a good condition. Then there's parts of the regulations that are less imperative to us, but it does uh, clarify a few things. As, as this is a new regulation, it does cross-reference into a few other bits. So it talks about the Housing Act and it says there's a few tweaks and changes to the wording in there. And also similarly to the management of houses and multiple occupation uh, regulations, there's a few tweaks and changes in there. Now, Schedule 1, does talk about the areas that are excluded so it's not every property as we said at the start it is private rented sector prs so it's not for social housing it's also not for shared accommodation with landlord and landlord's families or long leases seven years or more neither is it for student halls or residence hotels refuges care homes hospitals or hospices or any other accommodation uh, relating to healthcare provision. So it is the typical private rented sector that we're looking at here, not anything uh, on the side of that. And of course, um, should a local housing authority issue any, um, any fines, any penalties, there is a procedure for appeal for the landlords to go down. So they can always appeal and say, no, we have actually had this done within 27 days, here is the corrective evidence. So it's a great piece of legislation from our side of things because it's asking landlords to do what they should have been doing all along. And the notes in the back of it give some clarity as to what uh, is meant in the regulations and just expand out on some of the phrases. Now, from our side of things, as I say, wonderful set of regulations. It's a wonderful requirement because it puts an onus on a private landlord to do what they should have been doing in the past. And if as a reputable private landlord, you are always doing this, it doesn't change a single thing you've done. If as a private landlord who was not necessarily looking at the electrical safety, it makes you think, well, why wasn't I? I probably should have been, which is great because it just opens up a whole new work stream for ECA members to go out and inspect and test uh, properties and also uh, do that corrective and remedial action. But when we start doing that corrective and remedial action, when we start doing those periodics, what is it that we're, we're actually doing? Well, we, of course, checking the installation is up against the standards of BS 76671. And those requirements haven't really changed in terms of electrical safety. Possibly the best guide you'll find, and whenever I go out to PCA uh, regional meetings, I've always mentioned these things, the Electrical Safety First Best Practice Guide 4, which is freely available from this link on screen, or if you type Electrical Safety First into Google, you'll find it, is possibly the best guide out there. And more importantly than that, it's free. I do love a free guide. And it's got consensus in it about what is a code one, what is a code two, what is a code three, what is an FI. If you use that and follow those guidance, that's a great start. You don't have to stick to it. It is only a guide, but it's a very, very good guide. And it really gives you a good benchmark as to what you should be looking for on uh, electrical installation condition reports. But also as ECA members, you do get many other things. So uh, ECA members get access to our free uh, electrical installation condition report certificates. We've got 
plenty of guidance notes uh, available on the website. And we were asked once whether or not we could write a book about codes for um, periodics and probably wasn't very pertinent for us to do that, partly because we help write that electrical safety first best practice guide. It's really, really good. But also installation types vary and codes in different scenarios will change. So what we've done is made a little guide with a simple flow chart. Is it dangerous and does it require immediate action? Yes, it's a C1. Could it become dangerous? Yes, it's a C2. And it's a really nice little guide. Now we're not going to go into the details of condition reporting because one of our other technical Tuesdays that we're going to do is all about condition reporting and the codes that go with it. But ECA members have got access to all these guides and all this additional information. And if you or your uh, business are going out and doing condition reports, the best practice guide and the ECA guides make a really handy pack to give out to your contractors doing the work. Now, something we, we need to be a little bit careful of is the quality of work that is out there. And I'm sure everybody is at home probably nodding now. We've heard anecdotal evidence of contractors going around, not ECA members, I've heard some of that, uh, doing condition reports for 30 quid in a dwelling, you know, doing 10 in a day. And that's just not practical. That's not possible. That's not going to happen. You're not going to be able to have sufficient time on site to do an adequate and safe report. The client isn't going to get what they want. The tenant isn't going to get what they want. And at the end of the day, you're not going to get what you want. It's up to us and our industry to make sure the landlords are getting exactly what they need, exactly what they want, and in some cases what they don't want, because you might be telling them bad news. But we need to make sure that we are not underselling ourselves. We've been pretty bad at doing this um, in the industry for years. And if you go on some big sites, there will be a painter and decorator on more hourly rate than an electrical contractor, which has never been fair. So we need to make sure that we're doing our jobs properly, which ECA members always do, and we need to make sure we're giving the clients and the tenants exactly what they need, a proper, thorough condition report, saying all the problems, all the issues, all the C1s, all the C2s, all the C3s, all the FIs, and giving them all the information that they need. So uh, a bit of a whistle-stop tour of the, of the regs and the requirements behind it. And in a sense, this regulation is nice and simple. It can be summed up by private rented sector dwellings now need to have an electrical insulation condition report. That's nice and easy. We can say that and that's a job's a good one. A um, few details should be that the, the report should be done uh, a period of no more than five years. It doesn't need to be done for each new tenancy, but it should be valid for the period of the tenancy. So if you had a, a property that was let to short term leases six months, you don't need to do one every six months, but it does need to be valid for the full five years of that tenancy. And private landlords must ensure that documentation is shared between tenants and also those undertaking the report. So if you're going in to do a second periodic on a property, you should have the previous report available, which would be uh, always useful. Anything that requires uh, remedial action must be completed within the 28 day period, which again gives us a nice deadline to work with, really good. And there's very, very large financial penalties for landlords who don't comply with the regulations. And the regulations, if you do need them, can be found from the link below. So hopefully at uh, this rather strange time of year, we've got some good news going forward because this is a potentially great work stream for ECA members and ECA contractors to go out and do. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. Um, hopefully everybody found that um, interesting. We've got some questions that we'll, we'll move to uh, in a minute. Um, Gary, just, just one thing from um, my own sort of looking at the PRS. The five year uh, is a maximum and um, depending on what um, the report does actually bring up, you could actually recommend and that would be part of the legislation that um, if you recommended it was three years for the next one. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. If the if the installation warrants it, you can put down six months if you uh, if you so desire. It's it's a maximum period of five years. The the ultimate judgment is left with the inspector at the end of the day to say when this should be retested. 
Thank you. Um, I think there's um, certainly a question regarding qualifications. Um, does the individual doing the EICR need to hold a 239 war equivalent? Um, Shahid's um, answered that. Um, in terms of the legislation, it talks about qualified person. Um, I understand that MHCLG are publishing a guide to the PRS legislation. Uh, it, it really should have been out by now, but uh, probably COVID-19 has taken over priorities wise. Um, is there anything else that um, they should refer to for qualifications? Um, I'm thinking for our members, it would be the EAS. That's always a good start. I mean, the, the electoral technical assessment specification is is what um, drives the industry in terms of what is needed and qualifications and uh, how you become a, a contractor within a body a registration organization or a, a membership organization um, the es is is constantly evolving and it's it's timely really because there's a new version coming out next year uh, sorry this year uh, 2020 and built within it there's additional steps next year for new organisations to, to join. And it lists uh, applicable qualifications for contractors undertaking periodic tests. Now, at the moment, there's nothing uh, mandatory that says you must have a 2391 or something similar. But moving forward, the ES uh, will require contractors applying to be members or uh, registered with organisations to have certain specific qualifications. Uh, again, a bit like the legislation on here today in the uh, best practice guide, the ES document is a freely available document from the IET website. I encourage anybody who wants to have a look at it to download it and have a little read. Yeah, thank you, Jerry. Um, yeah, just just for anybody, if, if they're looking at um, the EAS, um, there are there are sort of two sets of qualifications required for QSs and those undertaking inspection and testing. Um, and one is Appendix 4A, which is the one coming to force from September 2020 and under Appendix 4B is for September 2021, where qualifications such as 2391 uh, are recognised. Um, right, uh, Luke, are there any questions from your perspective that you want to pick up or Shaheed? Uh, hi there. Yeah, sorry, we've uh, been uh, answering a few as we've been going along. Um, it was. Uh, I think there's. Sorry, sorry to cut in there, mate. I think there's one from Ryan Harrison, um, and he says, "Private sector has this become a requirement for insurance companies yet? Uh, do they also request a copy of the test cert?" Um, yeah, I mean, from my, I, I don't have any specific knowledge, but uh, I do understand that insurance companies will be looking at a requirement, um, but it'll be up to those individual insurers. Uh, and I'm sure more and more will jump onto the back of this. Why wouldn't they? Exactly, yeah. There was one from Paul Hill. Uh, what is the landlord's responsibility for HMO smoke detectors? And um, we've said it's a legal requirement that all rental properties in England follow the smoking carbon monoxide regulations. Um, so on the first day of a new tenancy, the landlord or letting agent needs to make sure that the alarm is in uh, proper working order. Uh, is there any need to expand on that one? It might be worth just mentioning that uh, when you're doing a periodic test, you're assessing against 7671. Um, now, this is going to be a silly example, I know, but if you walk in and the bathroom sink's leaking, you wouldn't put that on your periodic report. You'd mention it, but you wouldn't put it on your periodic report. Things like smoke detection and alarm, um, emergency lighting systems, they're a different set of standards, they're a different set of regulations. So it's not an electrical safety issue per se, if on a HMO house of multiple occupancy, the emergency lighting isn't uh, up to scratch. It would be an electrical safety issue if one of the lights was damaged and there was a live cable poking out of it. So you couldn't, um, in inverted commas, fail an installation for having poor fire or uh, emergency lighting systems when you're checking just the electrics, just as you wouldn't fail it for the sink leaking. But it would be very, very sensible to, to flag that up to the landlord, to the client and say, I'm just checking your electrics, but I've just happened to notice that your fire alarm, your emergency lighting, 
and your sink is, is all damaged and you might need to get those checked separately so you as long as it's electrically safe that's what you're doing on a condition report fire and emergency lighting regulations and legislations are a little bit different but they do still need checking as well okay thanks for that gary uh, there's also one from terry uh who says good morning all uh, why is the legislation specific to private landlords only is the expectation that registered social landlords are compliant already with GN3 frequencies? If so, why is there no reference point for RSLs to cite? I know we we do know that uh, um, RSLs are excluded from this, but um, I think the expectation is that so uh, local authorities um, have the remit to to look into and uh, in, enforce um, uh, that the, their properties are um, <coughs> up to scratch. More social yeah, landlords. Just to add to, to that, work. Though, sorry, Mike, you go ahead. Yeah, um, just to add to that, though, um, I have had conversations with um, MHCLG um, in respect to social housing, and they don't want to uh, see that sector as lagging behind PRS. So it is something they are looking at, and I, I would say watch this space. <coughs> sorry, there you currently go. is. It is excluded from this regulation, isn't it? Yeah. yeah okay, well, that's good, good to know they're looking to pick that up in the future. Just, just on a point there, MHCLG is, Mike? Uh, Ministry, uh, Housing, um, um, Local Government. Yeah. Oh, uh, and just on, on something Terry said there, um, guidance note three frequencies, it, it's a bit of a misnomer that they are mandatory. The, the, they are the suggested first periodic after the initial. So when it says three years, five years, 10 years for, for different building types, it's the recommended first periodic after the initial installation. From that point on, it's all up to the inspector. So going on from what Mike mentioned earlier, if the inspector walks in and the installation is an absolute mess, as the inspector, you can put that down as one year, six months, five minutes if you want. You don't have to go with three years, five years, ten years. Or if it's fantastic and well maintained, you can expand on it, depending on things like insurance, as some legislation and uh, other bits might uh, affect that. But it's only a recommended frequency. Uh, Gary, um, there's a question from Eddie at 1128, which is EAS question mark. Uh, can you just elaborate again, just briefly on the EAS? So, uh, where's the question? Oh, uh, the Eddie, uh, the EAS is the Electrotechnical Assessment Specification. Trips off your tongue, obviously. Um, if you type in EAS 2020 into Google, you'll find a link to the IET website. So when organisations like Search or come out and assess uh, you guys from, from our side of things, what they're assessing against is this EAS, this electrotechnical specification. And in there, if it says uh, all electric contractors need a blue hard hat, they'll come out and see if you've got a blue hard hat. If you've got a yellow one, we'll put a cross in the box and tell you to get a uh, blue one. Um, and in there, it will say you need your public liability insurance and all the uh, calibrated equipment and all that. Uh, it's been in and around for donkey's years now and is constantly evolving. And as Mike said, one of the things that's changing in the not too distant future is a, a tightening up of qualifications. Now, uh, hopefully this won't uh, uh, offend anybody on the group. The, there has been in the past. Uh, what's the phrase? Five day wonders. I think we all know what that means. Coming into the electrical industry, um, the ES is tightening up to restrict that, stop that, and to, for want of a better phrase, bring in proper electrical contractors. And that's that's never a bad thing. So if you want to have a look at what the ES was and what it's going to be, have a look. It's it's a freely available document off the IET site. Uh, Colin at uh, 11.24 asked, so are HMOs included and then in brackets housing used for student lets? Um, I know some uh, HMOs are specifically excluded, including student halls of residence and hostels and refugee uh, care homes as well. But um, other types of HMOs, they're still within scope? HMOs have got their own set of regs as it stands anyway, and they still require uh, periodics done every five years. So this is your, your your privately rented sector, 
one, two, three, four bedroom properties. Uh, HMOs come under the HMO legislation. Okay, thanks, Gary. Yeah, they've, when they've introduced this, they've done some tweaking to um, the Housing Act, etc., just just to align um, the different regulations. But they're still in place. Um, okay. Um, just one here, probably about demarcation more than anything, uh, from David. David Dunn. Um, where public access, e.g., doctor surgery or shop uh, or shop hall. Um, is it five years or one year? So I suppose you've got, a, I think what we're getting at is a demarcation between uh, PRS and a um, a shop or a doctor surgery or something similar. So it's a multi-occupancy building, presumably. You might find that it'll have different elements and different times to it. So um, if you were doing a periodic on a, a, a leisure centre, the area around the pool would need more frequent inspection than the canteen area. So certain parts might need testing at different intervals. So it, it would be the same with this. If you've got areas and parts of the property that are surgeries, businesses, etc., they might need different times to the flats above, if, if that's what you're, you're aiming at there. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Um, just another question that just come in um from mikey uh is there anything that can be done to restrict flyby inspections question mark uh it's the biggest problem in the market and you're absolutely right to pick this up um it's something that when this legislation came out um i've been i've had several meetings with mhclg uh, just put in our position that um in, in terms of defining um, more explicitly qualifications for those that are deemed to be qualified. Um, I think I think legislation uh, should have been a lot more specific. Um, it's something that they are looking at and um, they did have a draft guide coming out with the legislation which they've held on to and I think they're going to maybe try and tighten up a little bit on what they deem to be qualified but uh, watch the space. I can't. I can't answer that. But yeah, it is a problem. Um, but it's it, it's down to the landlord to employ a qualified person. Gary, do you want to add anything to that? No, no. I think the uh, the the there's not an awful lot you can do if a landlord is wanting a a bad job and somebody is willing to do that bad job. There's there's not an awful lot anyone can do about that. But. And, and possibly not the more sympathetic thing when we get um, members of the public phoning up uh, ECA and saying I've had a contractor come in and do some work and it's unsafe. W was he a registered contractor? No. Well, I don't have an awful lot of sympathy for you when it goes wrong. You, if you've got your mate from down the road who's also a tiler and also a gardener and also this and also that, He's probably not a very good electrician and it, it, it took us all a long time to be classed as an electrician because it's all it, it takes a while to do it properly um, and if you're using people who aren't suitable or aren't skilled enough to do that job you kind of get a, a rubbish piece of paper at the end of it so if a, a private landlord is using a, a fly-by-night type outfit at some point it's going to turn around and bite them in the backside and as we've seen earlier there are a few things within this legislation that is going to cause them financial heartache as well so it's it's really not worth it for what a, a, how much is a periodic inspection done once every five years on a property spread out it's not a lot of money it isn't a lot of money and when what's the average cost of a house 200 150 thousand well, from Middlesbrough so it's probably about 10 grand up there then it, over the cost of that building's life, it isn't a lot of money and there's no real excuse for private landlords to do it badly. Okay, thanks Gary. Um, so just somebody asking for some uh, clarification. So it's not needed on change of tenancy. Uh, that's currently recommended in GN3, question mark. Uh, was, uh, so it's not needed. No, uh, anonymous uh, eleven thirty three. No, it's not needed on change of tenancy. You've got to have it um, in place for the 
period of the of that tenancy or the tenancy the next one and the next one but it's not needed on change of tenancy it is recommended in other guides but um, there's, a, there's a world of difference between a legislation and a guide it's a good idea to have a little look around maybe even do a visual inspection but it's not mandatory yeah, I think um, I think when they were looking at the legislation, um, there was um, in, in terms of consultation, they had a lot of feedback in terms of short term uh, tenancies and, and, and actually enforcing this legislation will be very difficult for them. So I think that's why they went down the route they did. I think um, one of just as a point of reference here, one of the ECA members I was speaking to about this not too long ago said there's several thousand properties in his city that he believes are in the private rented scheme and 10 percent of them are tested all of a sudden he's got a lot of work to do now um, to go out there which is great but to be able to say that you must do it a change of tenancy and if that tenancy is only six months that wouldn't be feasible we we, we wouldn't have enough people within the industry to do that Okay, um, there's a couple of questions from Terry. Um, let's have a look. 11, 18, 19, 28. So um, Terry says, so the legisl legislation does apply then, question mark. Um, that's the social housing, presumably. Is the legislation contained within a revamp of the electricity work regulation similar to... Um, you are 1998. Uh, this legislation that we're talking about, which are regulations, are um, amendments to the Housing Act, and there's one other act as well, and I can't remember what it is, but it, it, it's not um, not safety legislation, it's within the Housing Act, under Emmett CLG remit, in other words. Um, I suppose one, one way of thinking about it is the electricity at work regs is one tool in the toolbox then you've got the housing act then you've got this then you've got the hmo requirements there's many many pieces of legislation that all get tweaked and tidied up and this is just a new one that is specific for the private rented sector um, okay. luke shahid is there anything that's um I haven't picked up that you want to pick up now. Uh, no, um, I think uh, I, I think we've probably covered most of the things that have come in. Uh, yes. Eddie was asking a question about the five day courses being pushed out. Um, but again, I think uh, Gary alluded to the fact that the tightening of the EAS is coming in to try and restrict these sort of courses. Eddie's uh, found the, uh, the IET uh, EAS spec as well. Yeah. Uh, and is that Eddie C, by the way? <laughs> if it is, hi Eddie, morning. <laughs> uh, okay, Ryan Harrison. Apologies, I've just waved at my own screen and obviously no one can see me. <laughs> uh, that's very good of you, Gary. Oh, <laughs> uh, Ryan Harrison also mentions that uh, it's best to treat it like a commercial or industrial period, uh, then uh, environment and use, and then environment and use will dictate the frequency required. I agree with that. Sorry, what was that, Luke? Uh, that it's best to treat it like a yeah. commercial industrial period, and then the, yeah. the type of environment and the use will dictate the frequency required. So if you've got lots of people coming and going, then obviously there's potential for, for uh, more degradation, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if you if you walk in and it's uh, it's a it's a beautifully maintained installation, you know the the, the landlord is in fantastic uh, condition and keeps it well maintained and well ordered keeping it at five years maximum uh, is, is fine. If, if you walk in and the tenants don't seem to be that keen on looking after things, the landlord doesn't seem to be that keen, then absolutely you can drop it down. Um, it's always always easy to spot when somebody's put a bit of mini trunk in onto a wall light on a flex and a plug top. Um, <laughs> that sort of suggests you might want to then bring the, the, the five years down a wee bit. Good stuff. Okay, I think um, Mook Shahid, Gary, if we've got no other questions that we want to pick up, we're just about there on time. It is Eddie, well, it is Eddie. Hello Eddie, morning, you're all right. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, so Luke, Shahid, is anything else you want to pick up? No. Yeah, no. yeah same here. Okay, I think we'll um, we'll finish there. Um, I think that's been a useful session. Um, hopefully, uh, that last question and answer was, uh, for me, it was good. We had good interaction. Um, keep those questions coming. Um, so, any feedback you want to give us, more than welcome. Um, we'll, we'll be pleased to receive it. Um, this is, you know, the second of um, the six that we're going to do. So, hopefully, we'll keep on improving. Um, Please, if you've got um, any concerns about the sort of COVID-19 situation in terms of um, furlough, uh, contractual situations, we have got quite a lot of information on the website. Please go to it and uh, uh, ask any questions that you, you think that need to be answered on your behalf or on behalf of the other members. Um, so very much a, a big thank you from me. Uh, thank you to Gary and the team. Um, please stay safe and well and hopefully we'll see you uh, or not see you but speak to you next tuesday so thank you very much and bye, everybody. Uh, goodbye see you later thank you bye